Okay, um, it seems that we have a pretty critical mass here, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Michaela Morris, and I'm an Oceans Fellow with Environment America um, Research and Policy Center. We are dedicated to protecting our air, water, and open spaces. We investigate problems, craft solutions, educate the public and decision makers, and help the public make their voices heard in local, state, and national debates over the quality of environment and our lives. So first, I just wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight for the global warming in the Gulf of Maine, um, this webinar, the sixth part of Environment America's Our Amazing Oceans webinar series. Um, if you joined us for multiple, thanks for hopping on again tonight. We are going to begin tonight's program with a digital tour of artwork inspired by global warming and seascapes across the world, led by Alyssa Irizari, the Senior Vice President of Bow Seat Ocean Awareness Programs. Then we'll narrow in on the impacts of global warming closer to home in the Gulf of Maine. The Gulf of Maine is the basin of water held between the hook of Cape Cod and the tip of Nova Scotia. It's warming faster than 99% of the ocean too. Dr. David Wiley, the research coordinator at Selwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, will share his research on the impacts of climate change on the Gulf of Maine ecosystem. Finally, Rhiannon Hampson, district representative for US representative Shelley Pingree, will share a few stories that show why healthy oceans matter to New England residents and Mainers and explain some of the policy tools that we have to keep our oceans healthy. At the end, you'll have the opportunity to ask these experts questions. You can do this by typing your questions into the Q&A box and we'll answer them in the order received. But before we dive into the panel portion of the evening, I want to share with you an experience that I thought a lot about as I put together this webinar. Each summer for generations, my family has gathered on Seabrook Beach. This is a stretch of ocean and sand dune located just um, above the Massachusetts border in New Hampshire. Decades spent in the space have really developed this really awesome informal base of knowledge that has been shared and passed down from my grandparents and my aunts and uncles to me and my cousins. We know where and when the pipe and clovers will nest, which parts of the beach give way to riptides, and can predict the temperature of the ocean based on the point of the summer we're in. These observations held true from the 1930s, when my great grandparents packed up their kids and tracked them to the coast, to my own childhood. But now the beach is changing. In June, the water already measures at August level temperatures. Erosion eats away at the sand dunes. And last summer, humpback whales breached just 200 yards off the beach. A neighbor who spent nearly 80 summers of his life on this beach said he couldn't remember seeing anything like that in his lifetime. I, I, that's made me wonder a lot of things, um, but mostly I've wondered what do these changes mean in our oceans um, for the future of our New England oceans. Will generations beyond me experience the same peace and beauty and majesty and comfort that I have been able to find um, on our coastline? That's why I'm so heartened to see so many of you guys on here tonight. Um, by turning your attention to the ocean and climate change, you're helping to build the movement to keep our oceans healthy. Now I'll turn it over to Alyssa, who will show you all some beautiful artwork. Thank you, Michaela. Um, can you hear me okay? Good. Yes, we can hear you. Cool. Okay. Um, so thanks and, and hi, everyone. Um, thanks to all of you out there for joining us this evening. My name is Alyssa Irizari again, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Bass Seed Ocean Awareness Programs. And this is my feline ambassador who has decided to also join me for this presentation. Um, so Bassett is a Massachusetts-based nonprofit um, working to engage young people in ocean conservation and advocacy through the arts. And as Michaela said, for the next several minutes, I'll be taking you on a artistic journey from uh, coasts and coral reefs to the Arctic and showcasing how Bassett student artists are creating work 
about the importance of these marine ecosystems to raise awareness of the amazing places and wildlife that we share this blue planet with, um, and really to inspire action for their care and conservation. Next slide, please. So Bow Seat arose in 2011 out of a documentary called From the Bow Seat, which was made by our founder and president, Linda Cabot, who is an artist and also a sailor. And the documentary actually focused on the ecosystems, communities, and industries in the Gulf of Maine, including the cod and lobster fisheries, and also efforts to study um, and protect the threatened Atlantic puffin. And Linda's teenage daughters helped write and shoot and uh, produce the film, and she saw that they were engaged and excited in a way that went in above and beyond learning about these topics in an article or hearing about them in a lecture. So she founded Bow Seed out of a desire to empower you through imagination and creation to be active stewards of our ocean. Next slide, please. Bow Seed's largest program is our Ocean Awareness Contest, which invites middle and high school students from around the world to explore and communicate how human activities impact the health of the ocean through visual art, writing, film, multimedia, and music. And I'll be showcasing tonight um, artwork that was created through this global program. And since 2012, more than 16,000 teens from all 50 US states um, and over 100 countries have participated in, in the Ocean Awareness Contest. And um, we're honored to have awarded nearly $300,000 in scholarships to help advance young people's creative talents and also their passion for the environment. Next slide, please. And over the past several years, we've built this archive with um, thousands of works of art and creative media focused on our ocean. And we've used these pieces in art exhibitions, at community events, um, in support of partners' environmental campaigns, which amplifies the students' messages for, uh, for conservation um, to larger and broader audiences. And this year, much of our exhibiting has, of course, moved to the virtual space through events like this one. Um, and we also have an interactive online ocean advocacy art gallery that you can visit at any time to see these award-winning pieces that are created by our students over the years. Next slide, please. So something that we hear often from our student artists is that before they began their creative projects, they didn't realize just how important the ocean is to their lives. Um, and our students come from all over the world and many have never even been to the beach. Um, but as we all know, um, all of us, no matter where we live, really depend on a healthy living ocean. Um, and of course, marine biodiversity is increasingly threatened by habitat destruction, pollution, and climate change. And um, for a lot of folks, the ocean might be out of sight and out of mind, so we want to change that. Next slide, please. Next slide. So for several years, our Ocean Awareness Contest theme was plastic pollution, which is something students really um, powerfully connect to, whether they're from landlocked communities in the middle of the country, or if they live on an urban coast. Um, and Michaela, you can um, just go through the next couple of slides of artwork. And this issue of plastic pollution offers young people a really tangible and empowering way to make change, right? They can make actual choices in their daily lives about what they consume that lessens their impact on the natural world. Um, next slide, please. And um, we, re we really see a hunger for this in the student artwork and in their written written reflections that the problem is so clear to them that they know that coastlines and parks and stream beds littered with plastic wastes and 
um, plastic toxins poisoning communities and marine life is not the world that they want to inherit, right? And they want to claim agency in participating in the building of a better world. Next slide, please. So coral reefs are also an incredibly popular topic for our artists. And this is really the Blue Planet generation. Um, and many actually reference this documentary series as inspiring an interest in the ocean. And we see um, reef ecosystems as a particularly captivating subject for our students. And coral reefs are often referred to as the rainforests of the sea because of their great biodiversity. Um, and coral reefs only occupy 0.1% um, of the ocean, but they support 25% of all marine species on the planet. Next slide. But when seawater has too much pollution or gets too warm, corals get stressed out. And if they're under too much stress, they eventually eject their symbiotic zooxanthellae and turn white. And this is called coral bleaching, which you can see in this um, diagram or this illustration here. And the leading cause of bleaching in our world's reefs is the rise in water temperature due to climate change. And if the temperature stays too high for too long, the corals will eventually die. Next slide. And according to NOAA, Around 75% of the world's coral reefs experienced heat stress and coral bleaching from 2014 to 2017. And bleaching has major impacts on entire reef ecosystems, of course, um, as thousands of marine animals depend on food or depend on reefs for food, shelter, and uh, as areas to reproduce. Next slide, please. Many of our artists also focus on human, how humans are connected to the health of coral reefs really intimately um, for food, livelihood, spiritual and cultural connections and um, protection from tropical storms in coastal communities. And you can see here the piece on the left how um, the student artist uh, Mackenzie created a series of masks to show ceramic masks. Um, to show this connection, which is a series that she names self-destruction. And she writes that the final mask is what our coral reefs will look like if we continue to ignore climate change and refuse to change our ways. Next slide, please. This is actually one of my personal favorite pieces in our, in our whole collection. Um, I love how the artist plays with time here. She's referencing historical scientific illustrations and Greco-Roman statues, and how if we continue with business as usual, artifacts of coral will be all that we have left. Um, but she's also thinking about the resiliency and the capacity of coral reefs to adapt. And she was inspired by uh, the underwater sculptural installations by the artist Jason DeCare Taylor, which are coral restoration sites that are submerged sculptures of human subjects. And I think um, some of the most powerful artworks by our students make space for sitting with that relationship between grief and hope. Next slide, please. So as we know, global warming caused by the burning of fossil fuels is also rapidly changing our polar regions. And the Arctic is warming faster than most other places on Earth. And one of the impacts of this warming is the melting of sea ice. Next slide. And the polar bear was the first species um, protected under the Endangered Species Act solely because of the threats from global warming. Um, polar bears rely on sea ice for hunting and traveling. So if there's no ice, there's no polar bears. And you can see in these works how our student artists are thinking about this. In Ashley's piece on the left, which is called Chain Reaction, she illustrates that the polar bear populations are unraveling because of the impacts from the fossil fuel industry. And Brendan's digital piece on the right shows what he calls global warming in action, um, an Arctic with little sea ice to support wildlife. And his intention was not only to educate viewers about the impact of climate change on the Arctic, but also to connect viewers emotionally with how wildlife are losing their home. Next slide. And even if we live far from the poles, as many of us do, um, changes in these regions do affect all of us. Uh, one of the major impacts being sea level rise. And um, a couple of years ago, NASA scientists said that we were pretty much already locked in for about three feet of sea level rise in the coming decades, which would displace millions of people. Next slide. 
and uh, sea level rise is already happening, right, in places like Boston, um, but also Miami, Florida, where both is these artists, Isabella and Catherine, um, call home and who in their pieces are reckoning with a landscape that's already rapidly changing within their own lifetimes. Next slide. Next slide. So I want to close with a pattern that we see emerging in our students' work and stories, um, and that probably all of us have seen rising up around the world, which is the power of youth movements um, and the reinforcing system of empowerment within community for uh, ocean activism and environmental activism. Um, next slide, please. And what I mean by that is more and more, we really see students who are finding their voices and are encouraged to do so by seeing it happen um, by and with their peers and being supported by adult allies who validate their concerns about our changing world and value youth's perspective and hope and capacity to make change and join them in that process. And we are really honored uh, that so many young people have chosen to share their work with us over the years. They're really what I consider leaders in modeling the emotional courage and the imaginative spirit that we need to restore our amazing oceans and build a thriving and sustainable future together. So thank you. And we'll, we'll close on a, another poem. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa, for sharing that amazing artwork with us. First of all, I'm blown away um, that students under the that that was all created by students under the age of 18, um, and their their representation of resilience and hope through artwork um, on a subject that oftentimes relates to destruction is very inspirational. Up next, we are going to hear from Dr. David Wiley about his research on the impacts of climate change in the Gulf of Maine. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Wiley. Thank you, Michaela. That was an awesome presentation and I'm terrified now to try to follow that. Um, most of my stuff is numbers, of course, but it does really uh, emphasize how art and science need to go together. You know, there, there's a real important way of, of translating information to the public and, and art does that. And um, I think we just saw a fabulous example of that. So thank you, but I am a little bit nervous. I wish I was not following you, but I am. So what can you do? Um, many of you don't know about the National Marine Sanctuary System. Uh, the Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary is one of, of many National Marine Sanctuaries around the country. You can kind of think of them as the coolest places in the ocean um, become National Marine Sanctuaries. We only have one in New England, and that's still Wagon Bank. Um, next slide, Michaela. And here we are. Um, that little polygon there you can see off the coast of Massachusetts and New Hampshire is the still Wagon Bank Sanctuary. It's about the size of the state of Rhode Island. The important part for this talk is it's in the southern part of the Gulf of Maine. Um, and the Gulf of Maine, uh, as the next slide will show you, is warming faster than just about any place in the ocean. So next slide. So the Gulf of Maine is warming more than 99% of the oceans of the world, which is really crazy. Um, we are in the southern part of the Gulf of Maine, uh, really represent a spot where you can have a good case study for what might happen um, to this whole area um, as, as global warming and climate change really start to focus on this area. And, and again, the Gulf of Maine is, is kind of a poster child for, for the things that might happen in the future. And so our research in the Still Wagon Bank is a case study. It's very restricted to the sanctuary, uh, but I think that you'll be able to see the implications that it has for the entire Gulf of Maine system. So next slide, please. So we're going to talk about really three critters. Um, sand lance, which is a small forage fish, maybe six inches long, as big around as your thumb. Humpback whale, substantially bigger than that. In the lower uh, photo, you can see all those mouths open. Those are actually 
trying to eat sand lance, and all those birds around them are shearwaters, which are also trying to eat sand lance. So our story is going to focus on those three species, um, sand lance fish, humpback whales, and great shearwater seabirds. Next one, please. So the panel on the left, I said there are a lot of numbers here, hopefully you can see them, um, is looking at the abundance of humpback whales in the sanctuary relative to the abundance of uh, sand lance. Sand lance are kind of the magenta line there, and those other lines are, are different um, life history groups of humpback whales. Uh, the one to focus on probably right now are mature females, um, which are the orangish line on top. You can see all of those different lines is a line for calves, a line for adult males, a line for juveniles. But the abundance of all of those, except the adult males at the very end, really mirror um, the abundance of sand lance. So if sand lance go up, but local abundance of humpback whales go up, sand lance go down, the local abundance of humpback whales go down. On the right, we've got a different set of data that we take in the sanctuary. And this looks at the abundant location of humpback whales and sand lance. And we use something called the Global Index of Co-location. This is an index that runs from zero, we're having no association, they're not together at all, to one, which means their location and abundance are right on top of each other. And that GIC for humpback whales is 0.99. So you can't get too much higher than that. So humpback whales are found where sand lands are found. And the more sand lands that are there, the more humpback whales that are there. Next one, please. So we also put tags on humpback whales. I think you might have to um, touch that. There you go. So we also put tags on humpback whales to see what they do underwater. So these are held on by suction cups and they'll stay on for maybe, oh, 12 to 24 hours. But they give us very high resolution data on what the animals are doing underwater, which really can't obtain any other way. Next picture. So we can use those. We go. So we can use those to understand what's going on underwater. So on the top, you have a time depth recorder um, showing the dive profiles of the animals uh, by time of day. And then the next layer down are, are visualizations of the movements that the humpback whales are doing um, when they're tagged. So in the daytime, the animals are swimming these spirals in the top portion of the water column, and they're using bubbles to trap sand lands. The bottom portion of that panel, you can see is EK60 data, which um, map out the distribution and abundance of forage fish, in this case, sand lance. So during the day on the left part, you can see they're all up in the top of the water column. If you kind of split that image in half, on the right side at night, you'll see a very different time depth recorder. The animals are going down and just going right to the bottom over and over again, all night long. In the middle panel, you can see the behavior of the animals taken from our, our tags. And they go down to the bottom, they just turn onto their sides and move along the bottom all night long, rolling to their side, come back through a breath, go down to the bottom, roll on their side. And if you look in the bottom panel, the reason they're doing that is because the sand lance um, have a diel migration. They're up in the water column during the day and they're along the bottom during the night. And the humpback whale behavior follows that movement of the sand lance. Next one, please. So humpback whale abundance, distribution, and behavior is highly influenced by the abundance, distribution, and behavior of sand lance. Next. So the next species we're gonna look at are great shearwaters. And we also tag those animals differently. Um, to tag these animals, we have to capture them. And we do that by attracting them to the boat with bait, and then we net them. Go ahead, you can do the next picture. And once we have them on board, uh, we do a number of things, but one of the things we do is put satellite tags on them. These weigh about 12 grams. We sell them to the birds back and then release them back into the Gulf of Maine. And here you can see these lines are all different colors are different birds and their wanderings through the Gulf of Maine. They're not really wanderings at all. They're, they're very site specific and they're going to particular places, for particular reasons. Next slide. This is a publication that we had in MEPS and we have a new and updated coming out. Uh, but in the right hand portion uh, is, if you can see the, the yellow, the greenish portion is the high density areas, high use areas for shearwaters based on the satellite tags, how much time they're spending there. And the black dots are trawl surveys where sand lance were caught. And over 60% of those black dots fall within the high use areas of great shearwaters based on the satellite tagging. So throughout the Gulf of Maine, 
great shearwaters tend to focus on areas where there are sandlands. So next one, please. So the animals that we capture in the stell wagon sanctuary and around the sanctuary, we take fecal samples and other things to try to determine what they're eating. So the left-hand panel, you can see um, that sand lamps make up the vast majority of their diet. Uh, over 70% of the birds had sand lamps um, in their fecal samples when we tested it for DNA. Um, the next highest one was Menhaden way down in 40%. So much, much higher for sand lamps. Using our data for sand lamps and great shearwaters, we again looked at that global index of co-location and the global index of co-location for um, great shearwaters and humpback whales about 0.96. So again, extremely high values for co-location of abundance and distribution of sand lamps and, um, or, excuse me, and great shearwater seabirds. Go ahead, next one. Um, same thing for commercial fisheries. I'm gonna put my glasses on so I can read these better, um, but sand lamps and flatfish, 0.9, Nine seven sand lance and cod 0.97 sand lance and haddock 0.86 scoping um, zero, uh, 0.72 so again high co-location uh, values for sand lance and many of these important commercial fish species so next one so what does all this have to do with climate change so we really wanted to try to answer that question so we worked with Hannes Bowman in his lab at UConn and his lab really specializes in raising um, fish under conditions of, of increased temperatures and increased um, CO2 content. So we went to the sanctuary and we trawled up uh, sand lamps, we stripped, uh, spawned them onto the boat, and then we brought those embryos back into Hannes's lab and raised them under these various conditions. Next picture, please. So here you can see um, sand lamps and climate change uh, their survival of, of, of hatched or the survival to hatch was severely lowered at higher temperatures uh, at five degrees being about ambient 10 degrees being obviously something in the future that may be um, occurring um, survival to hatch was also dramatically reduced with elevated uh, co2 concentrations so these two indicators of, of future conditions both had a real severe implication on the reproductive success of sand lands even down to the point of when the animals did hatch uh, they had reduced energy uh, reserves and reduced body size. So again, a severe um, implications for the reproductive success um, under future climate change scenarios. Next picture. Um, sand lance feed primarily on copepods. The right-hand panels, you can see the lower part, are calanus uh, zooplankton and the sample toes that we were taking at the same time that we were capturing sand lance. Uh, so we opened up the sand lance, looked at what they're eating. At the same time, we were trawling and taking uh, zooplankton samples, and they were almost all eating copepods, calanus copepods. In the right-hand sample, you can see their lipid content. So that lipid content goes up very rapidly um, in late, uh, late winter into early summer when they're feeding on calanus. They stop feeding about July and August, and all that, all that energy is then put into reproductive capability. Um, which usually occurs in October. Once they reproduce, they've used up a lot of their energy. You can see that falling back down. I don't have a pointer, but you can see the blue going back down. So the lipid content re decreases dramatically. So again, um, the amount of food that they have, the amount of energy stores they have for reproduction uh, directly is proportional to the amount of calanus and water column that they can feed on. Catalyst distribution is really moving quickly north um, because of climate change. So um, we're very concerned, of course, that Calanus as a food source is going to become a limited resource um, in the southern Gulf of Maine, such as the sanctuary. So if we look at sand lance, there's high co-location among sand lance and top predators, such as humpbacks and great shearwaters. Sand lance are perhaps the most CO2 sensitive species to date. And there's also um, synergistic uh, negative consequences with temperature effects. And sand lance are dependent on Calanus copepods, fewer Calanus copepods, fewer sand lamps because of reproductive reasons and also direct starvation that we don't have time to get into. So how does this really impact the rest of the ecosystem? We're going to look at humpback whales and, and shearwaters to try to get a handle on that. So next picture. So we have 44 sites throughout the sanctuary that we sample spring, summer, and fall, and we use a grab sample to use to grab and, and count the number of sand lamps that are in the substrate. And at the same time, we count the number of whales and seabirds 
that are in that area to see how they, they, um, they relate. So in 2013, we had a very interesting year. 2012, as many of you know, was the hottest year on record in the Gulf of, of Maine. We predicted a very bad year for sandlands, and we didn't find any sandlands in our trawls. Uh, we only saw one baleen whale in all those sites, 44 different sites. We weren't counting seabirds then, uh, but if you go down to the bottom, we were satellite tagging great shear waters. Now, because we don't do decycle our tags, we get about 20 locations a day. And if you look at that lower part, that little map there that shows the satellites from PTT, it's another word for satellite tags, um, there are 36 points there. So that's basically one bird flying through the sanctuary for that entire year. On the right-hand lower pan is some uh, Dr. Jukes Robinson who was tagging satellite tagging humpback whales that year. And the, sa the sanctuary is above Cape Cod there were no hump satellite tagged humpback whales that moved into the sanctuary that year. Next up, next slide, please. Now this is 2015. We had a much better year for sand lance. Um, we caught 90 in our in our little grab samples. I should mention that each grab sample only samples a tenth of a square meter, so it's a very small sampling. Um, but we found a bunch of sand lance in the southern part of the sanctuary. We had 97 baleen whale sightings in the same part of the sanctuary. We had almost uh, over 1,400 bird sightings, again, in the southern part of the sanctuary primarily. And in the lower two panels with the satellite tag shearwaters and humpback whales, almost all of the satellite tag shearwaters used the southern part, and there were lots of them that did it. Humpback whales on the right-hand side moved up into the sanctuary um, during that year also with the more abundant sandlands. So, next slide. Go ahead. So the take home message there is that when you have abundant sand lands, you have abundant humpback whales, and you have abundant great shearwaters. When you do not have abundant sand lands, they don't prey switch, they really leave the area to go find a better place to forage. So if we look into the future, um, we may have a very, very different uh, top predator and forage fish constellation in the sanctuary. And in the entire Gulf of Maine, we have a very potentially and likely have a very different species composition as these more northerly species that we have now move out and more southerly species move in. And that isn't minor, it's not just a replacement. So for instance, for seabirds and many of the seabird colonies along the Maine coast and in the Massachusetts coast, um, sand lance are great because they're like spaghetti. They're long and thin and they're really easy to swallow. Some of the species that are moving up such as butterfish are really rounder and very, very difficult for um, seabird chicks to swallow. So there's a really great documentation by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Linda Welch and her team, um, with butterfish just lying around the, these turn nests and puffin nests. Um, the chicks couldn't swallow them, um, where the, the sand lance, they can just slurp them right down with spaghetti. So again, a very different system that is potentially coming um, north, uh, and there may be real ramifications um, for the Gulf of Maine. So, are there any questions? Uh, my, the funding for this um, is coming from the Volgeno Foundation, it's one of our, our biggest funders. Um, BOEM has stepped up and been great uh, funding us for the past three years. This is the last year of that funding. We're hoping to uh, find something to replace uh, that source, uh, Sea Grant, uh, and the Sanctuary, and NOAA in general, of course. So, great. I guess we'll at the very end. Um, yeah, so ne up next we have uh, Rhiannon Hampson from Representative Pingree's office. Um, but first, I just wanted to say thank you so much for such a great presentation. Um, I love how clearly you painted the picture of the interconnectedness of the Gulf of Maine ecosystem, starting with sand lamps, which are a critical species, and they don't get enough airtime. So thank you for giving them some limelight. <laughs> um, up next, we're going to move to a presentation from Rhiannon Hampson um, of who works uh, in doc in sorry Representative uh, Shelley Pingree's office? Um, so I will let her take it away. Great, and I um, now I am really nervous to follow both amazing artwork and incredible research. <laughs> my my presentation is much more like a rambling narrative, I feel, than any sort of cohesive story that was told in both of those spaces. Um, so as, as Michaela had shared, I work for uh, United States Congresswoman Shelley Pingree. Uh, many people might know that my boss 
lives her life since the early 1970s on an island about 12 miles off the coast. Um, she, like many others of us in Maine, have our lives sort of dictated by the rhythms of the ocean. Uh, when we look at sort of census data, we find that almost 40% of the entire United States population lives along coastlines. So why do half of Americans choose to live along the water? We don't rely on the water necessarily for trade and, and everything else anymore the way that we did 100 years ago, and yet we still feel drawn to it and called to it. So I think um, my work with the Congresswoman in this space is really as much uh, cultural heritage and spiritual as it is my commitment to making sure that future generations can enjoy the same things that we enjoy. And then also that the ocean itself as sort of a sentient space can be um, as healthy as possible. So we're looking on this first slide at the view outside of our office. Our office is located on Fish Pier. We have the best view in Congress. Uh, there, it is a working pier, the Harbor Master is there. I can't come and go from my vehicle without seeing the Coast Guard cover and, and all of this work being done constantly. It's really grounding and it's a reminder of, of all of the sorts of different things that are happening. We can see in different seasons, the different riggings on the boats. We know when the Coast Guard's going out. Um, you know, it's really sort of this, this thing. My mom is an English professor and she loves to quote Emily Dickinson, of course, because you know, we're in Maine. And she says, I see New Englandy is one of her favorite things. And I feel like this view that we get all the time really lenses that for us and the work that gets done federally then. Um, next slide. So when I go home, I go home to down east Maine, which is an up near the Canadian border. Um, so this is the Eastport fisherman holding a cod. There was no cod relay race this year. If you have never participated, either as a watcher or cheerer, you can make yourself hoarse, trying to encourage people to grab hold of a slimy fish and run with it as a team. It's highly encouraged. Um, Maine's fishery is something that I can't not talk about when, when we're talking about uh, the Gulf of Maine warming. Maine has upwards of 9,000 commercially licensed fishermen right now, harvesting over about 14 different species. I'm sure that both of those numbers are actually woefully underrepresented. I think a lot of those are license holders. That doesn't count the sternman. It doesn't count the third share. It does not count, you know, the person who's unloading at the dock. And that brings in about $700 million in economic impact to our economy here. And again, that doesn't count the diesel mechanic. That does not count the guy that dives for traps when they're lost. And, uh, you know, all of these sort of peripheral um, relationships that come from our fishery. So uh, as Dr. Dave had highlighted, 2012, warmest ever in the Gulf of Maine. That sort of created a jubilee for our lobster fishery. Ever since then, as needs must, people decided to gear up. They trawled up um, and started fishing a little bit heavier because we suddenly had more stock. This presents you know, a couple of, of issues for us federally when it comes to that sort of shared natural resource being used in that way. Um, we have also, we have the safety of everyone in mind, and then we have sort of a long-term sustainability in mind because we have to step in as we've seen during the global pandemic when certain pressures come to bear on something that employs well over 10,000 people in a state of only one and a half million. So uh, the priorities that we hear about a lot from Maine's fishermen um, include preserving access to working waterfront infrastructure and um, regulations on boats and gear and things like that. So when we're talking about federal involvement in Maine's fishery, we really do try to look at it through a lens of environmental sustainability, especially for that preserving uh, working waterfront access. You know, that's something that benefits all citizens of Maine. It helps people grow up with those wonderful stories about going, you know, to coastal Maine every year and sort of um, preserves that emotional connection that actually facilitates conservation. So I loved seeing some of that in the artwork that Alyssa shared earlier. I feel like that's it. If you make it personal, you want to save it. Next slide. So personal is exactly what this is. Um, I feel like I can't talk about federal involvement in the Gulf of Maine and in New England in general without talking about the Coast Guard um, and the way that that does personally impact us. 
my own family landed in uh, Amesbury in 1650, and they've made their living on the water since then for about 11 generations. My great great grandfather was part of the US Life Saving Service uh, before. That was a, a all but volunteer group of people who were willing to run into the cold Atlantic Ocean in woolen outfits and little dories and Amesbury skiffs to save their neighbors and family members. And when they merged with the US Revenue Cutter Service in 1915, we got the Coast Guard, which is now one of our armed services. But their primary function here in the Gulf of Maine is to save lives. There's a photo here of the Lost Fisherman's Memorial in Quebec. Again, when I go home, this is where I go home to. Um, we've had countless community members who have their names, unfortunately, etched on that memorial. And there are five Coast Guard stations in Maine, stretching from Eastport up near the Canadian border all the way down to South Portland. So in 2017, nationally, they saved over 4,100 lives. Two of those people that they saved that year were very close and dear friends of mine. And, uh, and I was grateful to, to them, you know, beyond the beyond. When I think about the, the funding and, and everything that goes into having a Coast Guard service, um, it really brings it home and makes it incredibly impactful. Again, that's a shared natural resource. And so if the Coast Guard is going to come get you from that water that you fall into, they feel like rightfully so. They have a say in what you're doing on it. So they are also our regulatory arm of the sea here. And we do what we can to try to support them in that way. Next slide. Here's the fun part of Maine. We get to have these exciting adventures. And while I was watching the video that Dr. Dave had put up and thinking, I will never do anything that seems so extreme as tagging a humpback whale. I now know that that is perhaps a little bit beyond my comfort level. <laughs> I don't know, it's, that seemed crazy. Um, I did, I was very happy to accompany the Congresswoman out many, many miles into the ocean to see Project Puffin at Eastern Egg Rock last year. And uh, the extreme part of that is that we uh, offload into a dory, heave ourselves against some seaweed covered rocks, and then claw our way to the top to see nesting birds and primarily puffins with several others as well. So uh, Dr. Stephen, back in the 1970s, started repopulating Eastern Egg Rock. He did that through a combination of private fundraising and then also some solicited uh, federal funds. And 954 puffins were transplanted from Great Island to Easter Egg Rock in those first years. There are still 150 pairs that call that home. And the reason that I like to use this as a highlight of that federal private public partnership is that um, this is it's an unbelievably successful project, of course, for the National Audubon Society, but it's also had all of these other ramifications. So in 1973, they started collecting water samples, they take temperatures, they look at food sources. We had all of this other sort of aggregate data that they had been collecting for all of these years, and we had no idea then that it was going to come to bear um, in research across the board, especially with climate driven uh, scientific research um, as it has. So that's something that, again, at the federal level, it's where we can be involved, not only through regulations and, and everything else, um, but it's just it's a, it's a space where all of those interests come together for the mutual public benefit. Next slide. So I don't want to talk about specific policies, obviously, while I'm here, and the Congresswoman isn't anyway here. So, But I do want to talk about sort of those groundbreaking federal laws and programs that have really impacted the way that we exist um, today with our natural environment, and then, of course, here on the coast of Maine. So the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, happened in 1969, which feels unbelievably recent. And it was the first time that the federal government decided that what projects they may be funding could potentially have environmental impacts. And so we know that uh, in working sometimes with BOEM and a couple of other agencies, people get cranky about all of the environmental impact reports that they have to do, especially when we're talking about Gulf of Maine research. Um, but we, we are so grateful that that can even happen because for the first time they decided if they were going to build an airport or a road or a bridge or a windmill um, that we were going to have to decide 
um, sort of the value of what we were displacing versus the value of what we were what we were creating. Uh, the Endangered Species Act, which um, the artwork, the polar bear artwork, I feel like was so incredibly moving, you know, when we talk about that. So the Endangered Species Act came about in 1973, and that was really a federal response to deciding what, again, our priorities were going to be. We decided that for whatever reason, our interaction with these species was valuable and that we were actually going to stake a claim in preserving that. So according to the Natural Resource Defense Council, 99% of the species who have been listed on, on ESA have been saved from extinction. It doesn't mean that they're not fragile still, and especially when we look at, um, at coastal species specifically, and when we look at coastal plant and animal species, uh, but it does mean that they're still there. So we feel incredibly, incredibly grateful. I always highlight the Clean Water Act when I'm talking about Maine. The Kennebec River is one of the tributaries to the Atlantic Ocean. It's actually not that far up uh, from the mouth of the ocean, depending on where you go. And the Clean Water Act wasn't passed until 1977. So growing up in central Maine, I had teachers who remembered the Kennebec not freezing over, that it was just a foamy pit of despair. Um, the Clean Water Act came along in 1977 and started making some really significant changes really quickly about what was and wasn't allowed. And now when I drive over that bridge for meetings in Augusta, I can't not see sturgeon jumping out of that river. Um, and that's also thanks in part to the dam removal. But we, uh, we have, again, marked our priorities. And so in a fairly short period of time, you know, 40 plus years, we have created a much healthier way to contribute to the Atlantic from the Kennebec. And uh, it freezes over to the point where we have to call in, you know, ice cutters. And the last one that I wanted to highlight was the EPA Brownfields Program. It's kind of the newest of these environmental impact programs. And again, with 40% of Americans living in coastal communities and so many living here in Maine, the impacts of the environmental travesties that happened along the coast I really felt for a long, long time. In Northern Maine, we have the, the pearlescent you know, issue that happened uh, up near Eastport. So we know that these really significant environmental impacts are sort of larger than we can as small communities mitigate. So Brownfields is a program that we love. I mean, we believe wholeheartedly in and we are happy partners with the EPA in. Uh, Maine received $1.3 million in Brownfields funding this year to clean up spaces. Um, coastal communities in the last five years have benefited to multiple millions of dollars in order to clean up shoreline shoreline access and uh, yeah and we feel that that again you know with that the shared natural resource that we have rather than this tragedy of the commons you know that we all sort of remember from environmental economic classes um, we are in that way investing in making that sort of a better space to facilitate a greater lift so you know, we really focus on sort of these tied together spaces for the Gulf of Maine. We want to know where we can support and fund research. We want to know where we can support um, mitigation strategies when it comes to um, climate change in the first place that's driving some of this through fuel standards and, and other air quality standards. And then we really are trying to focus federally on resiliency. We want to make sure that coastal communities are not just going to survive some of these issues but actually be able to thrive long-term. Next slide. And I'm going to end uh, with a little E.B. White because again, we don't get to have the Blue Hill Fair this year. E.B. White was uh, the Charlotte's Web author who wrote about the Blue Hill Fair. It was the first place I ever took a spin on a Ferris wheel with my sweetheart and decided to get on board with farming for a lifestyle. Um, so I would rather, I would really rather feel bad in Maine than feel good anywhere else. And I feel like that kind of really speaks to some of the, the juxtaposition of like grief that we experience here sometimes because of that ocean. And then the hope that we have because of what that ocean brings us. And here we are feeling that pragmatic Yankee pride. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rhiannon. Um, I loved hearing those stories that really drew into sharp focus, the relationship between Mainers and the ocean. And I especially loved that example you gave about the Kennebec River um, and the resurgence of surgeon that demonstrates the resiliency of these ecosystems. And it leaves me feeling very hopeful. So for the next portion of the evening, we're entering my favorite part, which is the question and answer section. 
Um, so as audience members, you all can type your questions into the Q&A box and then I will read them and direct them to the correct panelist. I'll read them in chronological order um, and we'll try and get through as many as we can before 7 p.m. Eastern. So I'll give you a moment. Um, I think we already have a couple that have come in, so I'm going to start from the top. This one is from Thomas Brewer, um, and he, he would like to know what the consequences are for the Gulf of Maine, um, especially in temperature and salinity, and I believe um, consequences of climate change on the Gulf of Maine in those two areas. And I think, um, David, this might make the most sense to pass off to you. And if you just unmute yourself, we'll be able to answer the questions that way. Sure. Well, you know, the consequences are there's going to be winners and losers, right? Um, and it's hard to predict really um, who's going to win and who's going to lose other than there's, there's a general trend for fish species to be moving north or into deeper water. Um, as was stated earlier in, in Maine, you know, there's been a huge boon in the lobster fishery because of the warmer temperatures. How long that will last or if it is, is even lasting now is, is hard to say. Um, but certainly those are the kind of changes that are going to be occurring. Uh, but the only thing you can say for sure, there'll be winners and losers. But since we like the world the way it is right now, it's very productive for us. It's very, it's what we're used to. Um, we don't like to see those changes occur, um, but they are occurring. So we're gonna have a, a very, very different world 50 years from now, and maybe even 10 years from now than we have now. But exactly what that world is gonna look like, um, we're not sure other than it's gonna be different. Thank you for that um, thorough response. And we have another question also for you. Um, one moment, let me pull it up quickly. So this question relates to your research that you did in partnership with the Yukon Lab. Um, and Carol Walker would like to know, um, can Yukon hatch more Kalanis for, for sand lance to eat? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it really wouldn't be feasible. It would be you know, logistically possible on a tiny scale. Uh, but for example, a right whale eats tons of Kalanis in a day. So you really couldn't have like a hatchery for Kalanis like you could for salmon or something. Um, so it, it, it's, um, you know, theoretically possible, but not at the scale that would have any impact on, on the environment and the ecosystem. That makes sense. Um, yeah, in my experiences, I come from an English major background, so I've been, you know, learning a lot about the science and biology this year, and the ecosystems are so complicated. So that was a great question, and thank you for that answer. Um, so this next question is also um, for you, Dr. Wiley. So this one relates to the um, mortality event for large whale species. So David Dow would like to know, Given the unique mortality event for large whale species and the BOIEM plans to permit 20 large scale wind farms between North Carolina and New England, what are the potential conflicts? Well, the, the conflicts between wind farms and, and other things that are used in the ocean are being really looked at very intensively by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. And I think they're really doing a good job of trying to lay those um, risks out and how to minimize them. One of the reasons they, they funded our sand lance research uh, was because they, not so much for wind farms, but you know, for armoring the coast, they know that there, people are going to want, uh, as the uh, as sea level rises, people are going to want to use sand from the ocean to armor the coast, and they knew nothing about um, sand habitats really, and sand lance in particular. Uh, so they wanted to know that in advance of, of having to um, use, uh, attempt to mine these things and um, I think we were talking about NEPA documents before. They'd have to be able to show this in NEPA documents. So BOEM is, is really somewhat forward-looking um, in terms of trying to figure out what these problems might be and what the risks might be and how to mitigate them. Uh, but there's no way around the fact that when you start putting large-scale industrial operations into the ocean, um, there's going to be changes that, that occur. Um, there's a lot of noise associated with wind farms, particularly in the construction phases. Um, you know, they'll displace commercial fisheries that are already using those areas. So, you know, it's, it's almost like, you know, climate change in general. We like the ocean the way it is. It works really well for us the way it is. It's very productive the way it is. And anything that, that changes that is going to be controversial. Um, 
and, and should be of concern. Um, thank you. So we're going to pivot a little bit and um, about ask Alyssa a question next about the artwork that you gathered. Um, so one, one of our anonymous attendees would like to know, um, what are some of the most prominent themes that you see across your climate change, across the artworks that you've gathered um, surrounding global warming and the oceans? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I try to touch on on some of those prominent themes. Um, one of them being um, building that empathetic or emotional experience that we kind of talked about. So a lot of wildlife, um, a lot of um, we see a lot of emotional pieces about uh, like entanglement or um, wildlife losing their homes um, due to you know whether it's the Arctic, um, you know, melting. Uh, we see a lot, um, and I touched on this, but we see a lot of coral reef um, bleaching works, particularly in the past couple of years. Um, but yeah, pieces that that really want to um, emphasize that we have a, a relationship and a responsibility to oceans and and marine life. Um, this year, we we are seeing a lot of uh, Mother Ocean and Mother Earth. We see that we've seen that every year for for a long time, but um, this year it seems much more prominent. And I'm, I I mean I I love that, <laughs> um, but I, it seemed to be um, something that was coming up more and more, especially in the poetry this year. Um, trying to think of what else. Yeah, I mean I, I brought up I touched on the big ones. Um, the the power of Gen Z is is a really exciting one to see, um, and uh you know we see a lot of um the dichotomy between um like pristine good kind of before uh placed alongside kind of like bad polluted after human impact we see a lot of that um but we also see the kind of um spirit of that one person can be a spark of change and um be a part of that good side of the human impact. So human, you know, humans as problem makers, but also very much as problem solvers. That's a very powerful framework to think about our, our fight against climate change. Thank you. And I love seeing that represented in the artwork of students. Very inspirational. Um, this next question is from Darren. And Darren would like to know what makes the Gulf of Maine so vulnerable to rising temperatures slash climate change compared to other locations in our world's ocean. And I think probably Dr. Wiley, again, this is a good one for you, and maybe Rhiannon can hop uh, tag on at the end. Yeah, actually some of the best research on this is coming out of the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, which is um, part of Rhiannon's um, home turf. So, you know, it, it's really hard to say, it was really surprising to everyone that that was rising so quickly, uh, but it seems to be a combination of the fact that the Labrador current, which brings cold water into the Gulf of Maine, has shifted away, and the um, Gulf Stream, which brings warm water up to the Gulf of saltier water into the Gulf of Maine, um, is becoming more pronounced and more um, uh, more chaotic. So you're getting these warm rings, warm core rings that are breaking off and moving into the Gulf of Maine, and, and just bringing warmer water with them. So it's a combination of bottom water and 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 surface water that are both. Um, giving at least a double whammy into the Gulf of Maine, and it's a, it's a you know it's a relatively enclosed um, you know somewhat shallow embayment on a on a large scale. So uh, all those things seem to contribute to a a very rapid rise in temperature here. But why it's so high in, compared to everything else is is um, something that people are are still still looking at. Great, thank you, David. Um... Yeah, no, we'll have to keep an eye out for that research. Rhiannon, did you have anything to add? Uh, no, I would obviously have to defer to the scientist on the panel for that, uh, but I would just throw in there that I have, uh, I do get to go to Gulf of Maine Research Institute and have had some incredibly valuable educational experiences there, which are really accessible. And so the research being done there is phenomenal, obviously, to help solve these, these problems or at least answer these questions. And then the fact that they're making it so accessible 
is really driving that public education component. So I would just advocate for people when it, are able to do so, uh, to plan a visit and be able to avail themselves of some of that research that's right there. And they've got a great website too. It's, it's, as Rhiannon said, it's very accessible. They've done a great job of taking really complex things um, publishing them in great scientific literature, but then also kind of distilling them down in a form that is, is pretty accessible. So I'd encourage anybody to go go to that website. It's, it's a great, great resource. Great. Yeah, that's definitely going to go on my list. I'll have to check it out tomorrow or after the webinar. Um, so we have time for about one more question. We're about we're about at the hour, um, but this one is from Brian and it is for Rhiannon. Um, so since we know that marine, protected, marine protection equals climate stability, and that currently we don't have any protected areas within the Gulf of Maine, do you feel that there are opportunities to create marine reserves here? I feel like I should let Dr. Dave chime in first with the, our protected area. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Dave say, say this first and then I'll sort of finish with, with what I think the outcome. Sounds good. Well, it, the Still Lake and Bank National Marine Sanctuary is a federally designated marine protected area. And there's lots and lots of marine protected areas in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, they're all defined differently. So if you say a marine protected area can range anywhere from something that is a body of water that nobody can touch anything in, um, right to marine protected areas that are um, designed for single species or, or, or single situations. So there's a whole range of marine protected areas. There's lots of them in the, the Gulf of Maine, but I can't think of any that are hands off, nobody can enter, nobody can touch, nobody can extract, if, if, that's, if that's the definition that you're thinking of. Thank you. Yeah, I would just I would just add to that that I think you know we're looking more and more thoughtfully into the future federally. I mean the the federal government is a behemoth that takes a really long time to catch up with sort of public education and popular thought. You know it doesn't turn on a dime. It is an extraordinary large engine. So I think of it as trying to turn around like the lobster boat races that were all just happening this past week uh, versus turning around one of those merchant marine ships. You know, it's like we are over here on a lobster boat. We can pivot. We can we can see things coming really quickly. So all that said, I do think that there is sort of a turn of tide when it comes to thought around marine protection and resiliency. I think we're seeing more and more partners coming in. Um, even in different federal delegations from offices where we may not expect it, uh, who want to take part in protecting it because they're looking at the actual examples of this happening in their own districts. And so there's that old saying, my grandpa was like an old Navy guy, there's no atheist in a foxhole and there's no climate denier in a flooded town, you know, which is really, I think, what's happening. You know, when your own district is flooding and schools are being shut down in Southern Florida because they're under three feet of water, you can no longer say that it's not an issue. So all that, you know, as it relates to the Gulf of Maine is like, yes, I do see more federally protected areas coming probably because people are starting to recognize the value of having that. Great. Well, that is a really great inspirational note to end this evening on. Um, and now, as Rhiannon and Dave and Alyssa all mentioned, there's a lot of work that's being done to make education about the oceans and protected areas and climate change accessible. And one of the great ways that you can continue to access that information is by following Environment America um, on Twitter and Facebook, and also Bowsy on Twitter and Facebook, and I believe Instagram as well. Um, and I think even Stellwagen has a Twitter page and a Facebook page. So those are great resources. Um, recommend looking, looking up those handles and giving us all a follow. Thank you all again for tuning in this evening. Um, and we'll be in touch in the future about more webinars that we have and other ways that we can take steps to protect our oceans. Thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you.